My grandma always used to say, kiddos, the world's becoming faster and faster. Grandma Rosa, very wise woman. Turns out she was spot on. It's not only an intuition. I can show you mathematically why it is that the world's becoming faster and faster. But before we get into the mathematical theory behind it and no, You'll be able to follow along. Don't worry. I know if you, if you might be nervous about what I just said. No, you will be absolutely able to follow along. I will ex I try to explain it as best I can. But let's look at the empirical evidence. We don't have to go uh, to the math in order to understand that. Let's just look at the empirical evidence. Let's take the entire history of the universe and compress it into one year. Let's say the Big Bang was on January 1st, New Year's. Boom. Rockets go off. These were some big rockets that went off on New Year's, 12 o'clock in the morning. Then the Milky Way came around on May 1st. Well, ah, the winter was over and the Milky Way got constructed at the beginning of spring, right? The solar system, our solar system, that, you know, everything around our sun started then already in fall. Well, it was already fall, so September 9th. Formation of Earth, September 14th. Life on Earth, September 25th. The oldest fossil that we found in October 19, so this was uh, bacteria or algae, October 9, sorry. The invention of sex, <laughs> very important. Why is sex so important? Because of the recombinations of things. You know, you recombine different things. If you been watched the previous lectures on innovation, digital innovation, you know how important it is. That's why sex is really an extremely important thing because it's a combination machinery, new combinations. But that came about in November 1st. Eukaryotes, November 15th, Cambrian explosion. The dinosaurs got extinct December 30th. Well, now we are pretty much, that's when they died. The first humans, came about an hour and a half before midnight, an hour and a half before the year ends. Stone tools, so everything we talk about here, technological evolution, that is 11 p.m. on New Year's Eve, December 31st. Domestication of fire, cave paintings, first dynasties when we created our, what we call civilizations, bronze metallurgy, iron, Athens, the Qin In Dynasty in China, and, and the Buddha, that was five seconds before midnight. The Roman Empire, four seconds before midnight. The Renaissance, the Age of Enlightenment, uh, experimental science, that's a second before midnight. And globalization and, you know, the rest of science, uh, the self-destruction potential and space travel and all the other rest, artificial intelligence and the blockchain and the metaverse and all the cool stuff we talk about in the specialization that I, we can, that's basically, that's, that's just now. So things have become faster and faster. Grandma Rosa was, was really onto something here. And so let's look at why that is. And then we can also understand why technological progress inevitably accelerates. All right. So if you missed it, please go to our lecture about innovation, especially digital innovation. We have an entire course in the specialization about that. And there you can be talked about where new things come from. So where things come from, inventions and innovations are from new combinations. So we take just building blocks that exist and we recombine them. Mother Nature does some, nothing else when she recombines building blocks in her evolution. Mutation, new combinations. Selection retention. Mutations. She tries out new combinations. The blind watch market maker tirelessly tries out new combinations. Some of them get selected. Most of them get discarded. Selection retention. So that's the evolutionary algorithm, right? And we talked about how that works with technology. Please go back to that. Thomas Edison and how he tirelessly recombined 8,000 different chemicals and hairs from horses and minks and ostrich feathers and peacock tails in order to invent the light bulb. And most of the time, he failed or he figured out 10,000 ways that will not work. And we said this combinatorial logic goes by, if you remember that from high school, by the N choose K, the combinatorial uh, formula. So we have N things and we choose K of them. Let's go through a very simple example. Let's imagine we have four things. So the first is we can choose none. 
So we have one possible combination, not, not choosing any of the four. <laughs> then we have four and we choose one of them. Okay, so we have four choices. We can choose this one, this one, this one, or this one, right? Then let's say we choose two of them. So how many can we make? Well, we can choose these two here. One, two, three, four, five, or we choose these two here, six. We can make six combinations when we choose two out of four. What if we choose three? Well, we can have one, two, three, one, two, three, two, then these three, one, two, three, four. Ah, four. We can make four combinations choosing three out of four. And if we have choose four out of four, how many choices do we have? Correct, one. So how many combinations can we make out of four building blocks? One plus four is five, plus six is 11, plus four is 15, 16, 16. Good that we have the binomial sum formula because we can also calculate it like this. So it's just two to the four. The two and the base is basically you have two choices. You can take it or you cannot. That's, that's the binary choice. Take it or leave it. And so we take two to the four, we get 16 choices. That's the that's binomial sum. And so that's where things come from. That's where all the technologies come from. That's where building blocks come from. We combine new things and we saw how Steve Jobs in the lecture on innovation combined existing technology in order to innovate the iPhone. The iPhone is just new combinations of existing things that have been actually invented by the government and the, the, the elementary building blocks, as we talked about before. And then the private sector takes it together and, and combines it. And you do the same thing when you have a painting. You mix different colors together and you innovate. Or when you build Lego blocks. So in the arts or the sciences or technology or evolution basically does the same thing. And here's some of the literature um, uh, I, we already talked about. If you're interested in, in how, this, uh, how this works and more in detail the math works, then I, I kindly invite you to, to check out this literature. It's, it's really fascinating to, to see how that works. Now, what's going on there? Let's go a little bit more in detail again in what Schumpeter told us. So innovation consists in, in, in new combinations. So let's go through this combinatorial logic a little bit more systematically instead of using, using my little fingers, right? So let's say we have uh, nothing. How many combinations can you make? Well, one, and that is basically uh, nothing. Now, that's the funny thing about math. We have to be really rigorous even when there's nothing. Um, now, if you have one thing, before we said we had four things. Now, let's just imagine we have one thing. Uh, how many choices are there? That's where the two comes from, right? So because either you take it or you don't, or you take it or you don't. So you have, you can make two combinations. Not taking it is also a combination. Now, what if you have two things? Well, how many combinations can you make? Uh, you can take this or this, or you can take them both, or you can take none. So you can make four combinations and keep on going with this logic. What if you have three? Well, you can do that yourself. You have eight combinations. We have four. Uh, we already solved that, remember? So we had the four and then it, we, we, we raggled it all through. And then at the end, I summed it up with the binomial sum. How much did we get? Right, 16. So if you have five, please do that exercise yourself. You get 32. So what's the logic here? So the more building blocks there are, the more possible combinations we can make. Hence, the more different technology we can invent and, and the more innovations we can make and so forth. So all of this goes, as I said, the binomial sum goes with two to the power of the number of possible building blocks. So that's an, the building blocks are in the exponential and the combinatorial choices grow exponentially. So why the building blocks grow linearly one, two, three, four, five, the number of combination grows exponentially. The steps between them, the step size between them also comes exponentially bigger. So here I make a jump from one to two, here I make a jump of two, here I make a jump of four, here I make a jump of eight, and here with only one building block more, I make a jump of 16. So these step sizes here become bigger. Now, something very important, please note that the step size 
always also becomes always bigger and bigger. So the number of combinations here increases by one. And that's amazing. the number of building blocks increases by one. But then I increase this by one, this by two. This here I increase by one, this here by four. This year I increased by one, this year by eight, and this year I increased to, and this year by 16. So if this here is time, the years, year one, two, three, four, five, see how many different combinations I can make. So I have here, let's say I add one building block, a new building block every year. So when I say this year is time, and let's say, you know, each year I add one more building block. Now, linear progress. Each year we add one more building block and the year passes another building block. Then you can see that if I add one more building block, I can make exponentially more combinations. I can create exponentially more new technologies. So while I only eat, I, build, I add one more building block here, well, I can have two combinor, combinatorial choices. Now, in the later year, I add same old thing, one more building block, Whoa, now I can come up with 16 different technologies because I can recombine this thing. Now, obviously, as we said previously in the lecture about innovation, not every combination serves you. The tango washing dishwasher, I, I use that so often, I hope nobody really tries to invent one. I think it would be completely useless. Not a useful innovation. Uh, or maybe I'm wrong, who knows. But not all these combinations are really useful or practical for all practical purposes. Some of these things you cannot, or you should not, maybe they blow up. So some of the things you don't combine, but in general, even if only 10% serves, 10% of an exponentially bigger number of possibilities. So why the years and the number of choices, only the building blocks only grow linearly. So let's say, where does the building block actually come from? Well, a new building block just comes from new combinations. So let's say if every year, we only add one new technology that enables me to do exponentially more technologies. So I will add exponentially more technologies actually to in which then it allows me to have exponentially more combinations and whoo, things accelerate. Can you see that? So that's why. So why does technology accelerate? Well, because it's based on a combinatorial logic. Inventions and innovations are just new combinations and it bootstraps itself in accelerating runaway dynamic. Can you see that? Now, if I map technological progress on, on a graph, and to do in science, we usually read graphs, the exponential looks like this. So here I have the number of available parts, one, two, three, four, five, six, and the number of possible combination goes here. And exponential progress looks actually very funny. Most of the time, nothing happens. Like nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens, and suddenly, woo, it explodes. And then it's really like, it's like you realize, whoa, it's an innovation coming. Where does it come from? Well, actually, it has been brewing for a long time. Now, these exponentials are not very frequently presented in this, in this way, just because you don't really see what's happening here. What usually, how it's usually presented is on a semi-logarithmic graph. Why is that? Well, because if I take the logarithm on this side, then I basically convert an exponential pro process into a linear process. So the logarithm, you can think about it, it's the complement of the exponential. Some of you are here from, from engineering and from natural sciences, so please feel free to fast forward, but I, I think it's important to understand. And if this is, is not so intuitive for you, please take it slow, go back and rewatch what I previously said, and I try to explain it because this is important to understand. It, it's important to understand why society changes so fast. It's That's actually the generative mechanism. So footnote, end, <laughs> let's continue with the flow. The logarithm is the complement of the exponential. Same as, um, Subtraction is the complement of addition. You revert addition with subtraction and you revert multiplication with division and you revert exponentiation with the logarithm. So that's how you can think about it. It's its, it's complement, right? In, the, in that sense, the complement, you can revert it. So if I take the logarithm of base two, I basically eliminate the two in the base of base two, eliminate the two in the base, and I just count the exponent, zero, one, two, three, four, the linear. Now I would take the logarithm on this side here because that's what grows exponentially. So this here is the official formula. And then here you can see a linear trend. So this is the same, these two graphs are exactly the same. They, they show the same process. The difference is that on the y-axis here, I took the logarithm 
And here you can see it jumps. So I took here the logarithm uh, of 10 from one to 10, from 10 to 100, from 100 to 1000. So that step is much bigger. From 1000 to 10,000, that's a much bigger step. It looks here linearly because I took the logarithm. And here you still have, again, the number of available parts or time, clock time. Now clock time, year one, year two, year three. And then you see here, it looks like nothing happens and explodes. Whereas what you see here is like, well, always something happens. The number of possible combinations or technology that we discover grows over time. It grows linearly. And as I said, not all combinations serve you. And, but even if it's, a, if it's a constant percentage, let's say, even if in, even only 1% of all possible uh, combinations serve us, you will get that because you get a constant percentage of an exponential. And now when we take this logic and turn it on its head, we can also map out when different things happen, same as how we started. So while here I took the logarithm of base 10, which people often do, you can also always take the logarithm of base two, same as I what did here. That is intuitive and I personally like it because that represents every exponential process as a doubling process because the two means it doubles. It's two times two times two times two. And we often say that. So uh, when we talk, the technologists of us talk together, you say, well, the, the amount of information doubles every two and a half years and the computational power doubles every year and a half. And this doubles and doubles. What that means is exponential progress and and you take the logarithm, it gets linear, and we express that in a doubling rate. So for the rest of us, you can think about exponential processes as processes that double in a certain frequency. If you want to know the doubling rate, take the logarithm of two. All right, so as I said, if, if this was a little bit fast for you and it's something new, please go back and watch it again. And, and I hope it becomes more intuitive. As David Hilbert, the real Hilbert, the, math, the famous mathematician, always used to say, you know what? In advanced mathematics, there's no understanding. There's only getting used to. And so even in something as the logarithm, you know, we just get used to it. Uh, and that's what it is. Express a doubling, uh, exponential process is a doubling rate. And... Um, combinations, new combinations grow exponentially faster than the number of new building blocks. And actually, the new combinations become the new building blocks. So it's intuitive that's a runaway dynamic. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Now, if you look again at the empirical data, going back to the empirical data, what, what they did here, what Ray Kurzweil did here is he took the entire thing upside down. He also took a, uh, actually took a log log plot here. And what he did is he took it the other way around and he plotted every time something happened in history. Same as the first slide when we started this lecture, you know, the origin of the Milky Way, the invention of sex, the first stone tools, the first and so forth, the, the first dynasties and everything. Some historian, Carl Sagan and others, the American Natural History Museum would say something important happened. He just plotted on this chart and then he counted the time before the presence. So we actually going here to the presence and you can see it's actually it's impressive. This linear line, right? Like in science, we don't see linear lines like that so often. So it actually shows you, it's not cool. It shows you that something that happens in real history and not real history and the only history we have since the Big Bang and done by 15 different historians independently, we can see, you know, it creates like something that ever happened creates a perfectly straight line, which can be explained by this quite simplistic combinatorial logic. Now, it's a little bit more complex in, in, in reality, and I invite you to, to read the literature I, I previously mentioned. You can look a little bit into that. Now, going back to accelerating nature of change, let's ask ourselves, let's really let it sink in. Like, what does that mean? So, for example, let's look at the domestication of fire, important innovation. So, lightning was striking in the woods, the woods was on fire, and we went in there with our torch and we got the fire out, we brought it back to our caves. <laughs> proud monkeys as we were, right? And we uh, we started the fire in, in front of the cave and that you know got the other animals away and it protected us. It, it allowed us to cook meat, which was very important also for our, for our evolution. Nutrition possibilities get different kinds of nutrition and so forth. And, and so the domestication of fire was extremely important for us as humans that, you know, separated from, from, from the rest as the, of the animals. How long do you think it took us 
from the domestication of fire that we had in front of our cave. And hopefully that thing didn't go out because uh, we had no idea how to restart it. How long do you think it took us from the domestication of fire until we understood how to start a fire? How many years do you think passed? Well, you know, it's been 2000 years since, since we started to count in our Western calendars, since the year zero, and you know, now we're in the year 2000 and something. So that's 2000 years. How many years do you think have passed between the domestication of fire and the innovation of starting a fire? 150,000 years. Yeah, I mean, we were still pretty, we were still pretty, and we were always sitting in front of there because that couldn't go out. And often, you know, the story is that the man would sit in front of the fire. I once asked an anthropologist about it, and they said, yeah, the man would sit in front of the fire, and the women were in the cave with the children. The women were much more important and valuable because they were also during the day, you know, with the children, raising them, and for for fitness, that was, was the most precious thing. And then women would collect berries and fruits and climb on trees, very good climbers. What what did the men do? Well, they were hunting. This basically means they were taking naps, waiting until mammoths would walk by. And then, you know, if they got lucky, like jump on it. Besides that, they were taking naps and during nighttime as well, basically sitting in front of the fire, taking naps. And what this one anthropologist told me, and I don't know if that's true. <laughs> please, please let me know if, if, if not, if you know a better story uh, or the true this story. He said, that's why also men love uh, to stare into the TV and you cannot really talk to them. You know, when, when men, when we watch sports and we don't really want to have a conversation about it, we are basically staring into the fire. And that's what, because that's what we've been trained for like 150,000 years. You're just sitting there and hopefully that thing didn't go out because we had no idea how to start it. Now, we already had stone tools at the time. Actually, let's ask about that. How many years before the domestication of fire did we have stone tools around? That means we clapped stones on stones all day long. We worked with stone tools, so sparks were flying. How many years did you think passed from the, then when we started to use stone tools until the domestication of fire? Three million years. So things became faster and faster even in that. You know, it took us, it took us a long time to figure that out. Now, on the contrary, the first time we did a man-made flight and basically you know, we jumped for 120 feet, for like 30 meters and almost killed ourselves. It wasn't really flying. But once we understood this stuff with the flying and the aerodynamics, 60, 60 years later, we flew to the moon. So things really become faster and faster. It took us a long time, 3 million years, 150,000 years, nothing happened. And now in 66 years, we flew to the moon and mother nature never figured out how to fly, fly to the moon. We figured it out because we have so many building blocks that we now, the combinatorial logic is actually an intellectual logic that we humans are especially good with. And now we actually also create technology that becomes good with it. And that will certainly also hit the accelerator button because artificial intelligence is a very powerful additional building block that can help us to look for new combinations and therefore continue the, accel the acceleration of technological progress. So, summing up in a nutshell, why do things become faster and faster, as my grandma used to say? Because of combinatorics. And that's the easy answer. I hope now you understand what that actually means.